Acts in chapter 16, we see now that uh, Paul and his party, uh, he has Titus, who's a Gentile. Luke is going to join him. We see that, um, that Timothy, who was um, Jew and Gentile, and of course he, he was circumcised so that he could be considered a, a Jew, uh, and that would not impede his progress as far as going into the churches, uh, as long as they were going west. The Lord, uh, Paul probably would not have done that if he's going back uh, to Jerusalem, because, of course, he really was willing to lose friends and uh, really uh, drew the line in the sand about uh, going back into Judaism, even with Barnabas and others, and so we, and Peter. And so we see that, uh, that as long as he was going out, uh, going to the west, and he didn't want that to be an impediment with Jews that they would run into. And since, then since uh, that uh, Timothy could already be considered a Jew, then go ahead and uh, let him be circumcised. And so then we see not only Timothy and Titus, and also Silas. And Silas was a prophet, which means he was a preacher. And so we see him and uh, uh, Paul both uh, being beaten on at the same time, rather where uh, Barnabas wasn't a preacher, so he was one of those who was in kind of the background. And, but here we see that these two men are uh, going to take uh, uh, some hits, let's put it that way, in chapter 16. Chapter 16 is full of, uh, of um, activity, and we see it centers around the city called Philippi. Now we'll begin in verse uh, 6. Now when they had gone through Phrygia and to, through uh, the region of Galatia. Now, Galatia were those three cities that Paul would write to later on, and that was Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe. And they were all part of the area that was called Galatia. So when he wrote to the Galatians, he was writing to those churches. And so we see that as they were going through the churches, that they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit uh, to preach uh, the word in Asia, which we consider Turkey today, Asia Minor. After that, they came to Mysia. Uh, they tried to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. Bithynia would be on up where, uh, around the areas of Black Sea now, around Moldova and even on into Ukraine and places like that. But uh, the Lord did not permit them to go there yet. So passing through Mysia, through uh, Mysia, they came to Troas. Now Troas was the dead end I mean, it's about as far as you can go northwest toward the Dardanelles, if you know anything about geography over that area, uh, the dividing line between Europe and Asia, and you had uh, the, the Dardanelle Straits there, and you had the, the Asian Sea, and uh, Troas was about as far as you can go. Uh, they couldn't go north, south, or east, and so they just kept going northwest until God stopped them, and here they were at Troas. What do we do next? And so, and uh, then a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man from Macedonia stood pleading with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, after he had seen the vision, immediately uh, when uh, we saw it, now notice there's the we. This is the first, th the first of three times that we see that uh, um, Luke enters the we. He's, he's going with them. And then we'll see it disappear. He may have stayed in Philippi after Paul left. So uh, we'll see. It's kind of interesting. Notice your pronouns, especially in the book of Acts. And so we see, and immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, uh, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and the next day we ended at uh, uh, Neapolis. And so two days. Now later on when he's coming back in Acts chapter 20, it takes him five days to get back, but it's the same trip except coming to the back. So we can see uh, you can learn a lot about even nautical, the winds and everything even back then. And, uh, the, uh, and from there they went to Philippi, which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony. And we were staying in the city for some days and on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made. And we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. Now, a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira. 
who worshiped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the thing Paul, spoken by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. Now, Father, we pray that you will bless the reading and the preaching of your holy word this morning. Oh, Father, how we pray that as you have called us to Belvedere, and Lord, as you have called us to be a witness for you, oh, Lord, send the light. We pray, Lord, that that light uh, will, will be sent through us, that you would empower us, that uh, we would burn brightly. We sing that little song, let, uh, uh, let our light shine. Hide it under a bushel, no, let our, let our light shine. So, Father, we pray that you would bless, our, bless your people as we would be the light to Belvedere. Oh, Father, we pray that you'd cleanse us so that there's no dirty lens, that the people uh, can see the message clear and plain, that you would use us mightily, Lord, in this city and around the world and with the gospel preaching, that souls will be saved, lives will be changed, saints will be strengthened. And Lord, that you can uh, mightily, that your word can go forth from this place. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Now, when, as they had gone through this area, of course, we remember last week that Paul and, and Timothy and Titus uh, and, um, and uh, Silas now went by land route, and they were going, and they had the purpose of going in reverse order to the cities that they had, had won to the Lord, or many of the people of the churches that had been won to the Lord in those cities. Uh, but they had gone up from Cyprus and gone up north and then uh, to the west, and Derby was the last city. Well, now we see that uh, as they go on the land route, then Derby is the first city, and they go and they go to Lystra and Iconium, and then they were planning on going on to the west. And if they had, then they would have wound up in the areas of the seven churches of the Book of Revelation. And so they would have had Ephesus and Thyatira and all those areas. After all, we see that Lydia was from Thyatira. And so we see that if they had gone that route, then, uh, then uh, things would have been different than they are today. But uh, now, the, what, did the Lord care about Ephesus? No, Ephesus became pa Paul's ma magnum opus, uh, his greatest work, actually, in the third, uh, uh, the third missionary journey. But it's interesting how that God's timing wasn't ready for that city yet. And so, but, but the Lord was ready and the people were ready in Europe. And so they were going to cross the Asian sea, Asian sea. And as a result, Western civilization has been totally changed. Now notice how that as they were, he, the doors were closed, they were forbidden by the Spirit to preach the word uh, as they were going in that Western direction. I wonder how God did that. Now, you say, well, obviously God was told, uh, Timoth, uh, told Paul, go here, go there. No, the Lord led Paul at certain times, and we see that God expressly revealed himself to him at this time because of certain things. Of course, we see that there were three basic times that we see God was changing the course of church history. We see it uh, with Philip, with the... Uh, Ethiopian eunuch who was going to go to Africa, we see that uh, Peter, his whole mind was changed as he preached the gospel to uh, Cornelius, who was a centurion at the seaport of Joppa, which would be the, uh, carrying the gospel around the world. And so we see that God did that with those two men. And now we see that God, the Holy Spirit, reveals himself to Paul as he says, I don't want you to go to Asia now. I want you to cross over into a whole new continent. And folks, I'm glad he did because I'm a, from European de descent and most of us are here. And so if not, then uh, you were covered by either Philip or Peter. So it's interesting how that God's gospel was going forth. And we see those three major times that the Holy Spirit expressly told his servants to go where and to do what. And so we see that uh, now... Uh, Paul is moving, but he, but how does God do? How does God close doors? You know, did he give him sickness? Did he cause their cart to break down? Did he cause robbers to come along? I don't know. God doesn't, Luke doesn't tell us. But, uh, you know, what, how does God direct you with the Holy Spirit? 
I love to sing that song, uh, uh, Jesus Led Me All the Way. But you know, I look back in my life, and the times that I see where God led me, at the time that I was going, I didn't see God leading me. In fact, there's many times that I got, I'm so glad that God said no. How about you? I mean, there are so many times that God, that I was wanting to do something, but circumstances got in the way or impossible. God just let me know. Either I ran out of money or I ran out of time or I ran out of energy, health problems, all kinds of different things that can happen to keep us from doing what God, what we think God wants us to do. But as someone has said, if God closes the door or closes, that doesn't mean that he's closed all the doors. He's just wanting you to look. And what, what did he tell us? Ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and you shall find and knock. You're always looking for the open doors. Lord, where do you want me to serve? Lord, what do you want me to do? And there's several ways that God will lead us. And I look back on my life, especially in the times of the most tumultuous time of my life, and I didn't realize God was leading me. But uh, I didn't know, I really didn't, I never thought I'd be a preacher, just to be honest with you. And a lot of other people didn't either, but there were some that did, you know. So it was interesting how that, uh, how that God led. And I would try, boy, I, I would try so hard, and boy, I was one of those zealots, and uh, I'd fall flat on my face. But, you know, every time that, uh, every place I went, and th- th- this is the way God used, he uses circumstance, he uses, first of all, the Holy Spirit in your life. Then God also will use the church. In other words, people around you who will, uh, who will guide, who will, encourage you along the way. If God tells you to do something, many times he will tell other people also. And that's what I do even as a pastor. I kind of, okay, Lord, if you're telling me this, then that means that if you want the church to follow me, then you're going to open their eyes too. Now, I just can't come in here and say, okay, uh, I think, uh, folks, the Lord wants us to build a new building out there on Newburgh Road, and we're going to start next week. I think everybody here would go, you know, no. Uh, if God wants us to do that, he's going to tell you that too, and some of you are going to have some money to help me. So, you know, so there again, God uses the Holy Spirit, God uses people, and then, of course, God uses circumstances. Now, like I said, I was, my, from the time the Lord, I felt like God was wanting to use me in my life until the time I became a pastor about eight, eight years later, I mean, I can just say all kinds of things where God led me and other times where he stopped me. And I would go, wait a minute, Lord, here I am charging ahead. But he was teaching me a lot of things where he would teach me, but then he would change directions in my life. And so uh, I found uh, one church, just to be honest with you, I found out how not to lead a church. (laughs) But it was a good experience. And so there again, uh, but even in the service, uh, I was thinking, man, I'm going to just give, you know, and I was thinking, and I never will forget, I just really came to, back to Naval Air Station, and I was down. I mean, everything at home was falling apart, and it seemed like my whole life was falling apart, especially when you're 19, 20 years old. You don't know where to go next, and you're telling the Lord you're going to follow him, and he's not showing you anything he wants you to do. And you're just, oh, Lord, I mean, how am I supposed to be this mixed up if I'm following you? And I, uh, I just was going to chuck it all. And uh, I never will forget this little Jewish lady, about this tall, maybe about that tall. But she was, now, she said, she walked up to me. She, we, we were uh, in Naval Air Station. It's one of those where you had government workers working with us, uh, with servicemen uh, in uh, communications. And she walked up to me and she said, uh, you're going to be a preacher, aren't you? <laughs> I go, what? And uh, how did she, you know? And I just, she started, she said, we call them rabbis, but you're going to be a preacher, aren't you? And I'm going, wait a minute, Lord, I can't get away from this. I, hope, I, I don't know. I hope that lady got saved later on. But, you know, it's amazing how that God just will not let you go when he's leading you, even though you don't know where you're going. Oh, that is so frustrating. And yet, the Lord, the, my Lord knows the way through the wilderness. All I have to do is follow him one step at a time. Now, here Paul is getting up on the day. He says, hey, we're going to go to Ephesus. That's a big city or Laodicea or some of those. Those are very nice cities over there. We need to reach for the Lord. And whatever it was, stopped them. 
Now, we don't see the Lord revealing himself and the Holy Spirit saying, okay, Paul, you're not going there. But later on, he looks back on his life, or Luke looks back and says, the Holy Spirit prevented us. And can you do that in your life as a Christian? You can look back on certain things and you say, uh, there are times when God definitely answered prayer. And there's other times I'm glad that God didn't answer the prayer the way I wanted it. And you see how that God led you all the way. All the way, my Savior leads me. And that's what we want. And so when we get frustrated in life because we really feel like God's wanting us to do something and there's frustrations there, then we want to sit back and say, okay, Lord, what are you doing in my life? Don't give up. God is just ready to reveal himself and he does it through the leading of the Spirit and uh, with God's people as well as uh, every church I went to. And I would try to stay in church and people would immediately think I was a preacher. <laughs> just one of those things. I, I, hey, wait a minute, I don't want to be a preacher. You know, it's, a, not, it's one of those things. I don't know. I mean, you don't know me. I mean, uh, how can God ever use me as a preacher? But it was just one of those things where God just was leading me, and I didn't know. But at the same time, I had all kinds of personal problems going on in my life. My mother was dying with cancer. I had all kinds of home problems. I didn't know, well, I don't want to get too, too deep into it, but I didn't really have a home life. And I didn't, my hometown was, uh, of Disney World was moving in and all kinds of things were changing and all these different things that my little old town wasn't going to be my little old town now. It was a town of 4,500 then. It's a town of over 50,000 now. So you can imagine just what the change, uh, the top of just everything in my life was totally upside down. And so I, but I look back on it and see how that God led me and how that God prevented me. And I'm so glad, he, oh, thank you, Lord, for certain things. And I won't get into them. Some of them are very personal. But uh, how that God stopped me from the things I really wanted to do. And so don't get frustrated if God, if you feel like God's leading you and you just run into a wall. Well, there's a door there some way, somewhere. God is wanting you to go through. But what are we to do? Ask, uh, like A-S-K, ask, seek, knock. That is for you people from Illinois, uh, knock starts with a K. No, uh, but no, it does. I say maybe from Georgia. We used to say that from Georgia. But anyway, uh, you know what a, what a Georgia dump truck is? It's a wheelbarrow. But uh, Georgia ice cream is grits. But so, you know, so we always used to kid to people from Georgia about that. But uh, there again, we see that, uh, you know, certain times you just you know, ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it will be shall, shall be opened unto you. Behold, I give to you a, an open door, the Lord told of the, of the Philadelphia people. And so we see that uh, we look for the open doors. We look for the openings. Lord, if you've closed this, then what are you wanting to do? So we noticed they didn't just stand still. They kept moving in the direction that was free to go. I mean, and that was to the northwest, totally away, or they were going to miss those uh, five cities or those seven cities of, uh, of Asia that uh, later on John would reach. And of course, Paul would reach also. But here we see that uh, God was leading them uh, and he was doing it, uh, as some people have called, um, by, uh, as he, by closing doors and by the Holy Spirit uh, um, changing their direction in certain ways in order, and doing it negatively. And so as they were going toward uh, Troas um, to the dead end, we see that uh, now all of a sudden they couldn't go any farther. So what do you do when you can't go any farther? You wait. They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. And so notice that uh, in verse 9, and the vision appeared to Paul in the night and a man from Macedonia. Now, how did he know he was from Macedonia? Different culture, different clothing. There, there was just something about a, Mes a European that was different than an Asian. And so that and plus, who knows what other ethnic situations there, but you can just spot a person from Macedonia that wasn't from Asia. So he saw this man, and notice what the man is saying. Come over, he said, no. The man said, come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, Macedonia was the cradle of the Hellenistic movement, 
which, which, which actually began with Aristotle and Plato and all those great philosophers and education and all these things that uh, Philip of Macedon and his son Philip II uh, really said, this is, you know, if we educate the world, then the world's going to be a better place. And then Philip II had a son by the name of Alexander. And Alexander said, I'll do it, Dad. After his dad was assassinated. And so he conquered the world so that he could spread Hellenistic philosophy. And really what happened by the time of Jesus Christ came along a couple of hundred years later, we see that uh, the Greek influence had gone all the way from Spain to India, India to Spain. And people, uh, that's why Paul could go to Tarsus and, there, uh, and then uh, to throughout the whole Roman Empire and there would be people there that could understand his Greek because it was the trade language of the day. Isn't it interesting how that God prepared the place? And so whether you're in Asia or in Europe, you could understand Greek. And so Alexander the Great was going to spread it through war, and the Lord Jesus Christ was going to come in that very area, and he was going to start spreading the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the Lord knew exactly what he was doing. And so we see now that the Lord led them to Philippi. Now, Philippi, of course, so we see that he says now the, 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 that God is ready. He's got people ready. Come over and help us. These people, education left them empty. Uh, power from Rome left them cold. They realized there was something outside of this Greek philosophy and all these Greek gods who were just as bad as we are because they all, you know, they, they run around on each other and kill each other and all these different things. Uh, there's something wrong here. It's interesting that Luke, who was a Greek, wrote the gospel of, of Luke and the book of Acts to the Greeks. And so here we see that, uh, or Greeks or Gentiles. And so we see that, uh, that therefore, sailing from uh, Troas, we ran straight course to Samothrace, and the next day to Neapolis. Those were all little seaport cities north of Philippi, and they came down to Philippi, it was named after Alexander the Great's father, which was the foremost city in that part of Macedonia. So it was the key city. It was a colony. Now, notice how that he says all this because Luke is very precise. It was a colony of Rome. What has happened was that uh, back uh, about a generation or two before the Lord Jesus Christ, you had Julius Caesar, of course, and all the things, and, the, and Rome was approaching its heyday as far as power. But uh, in the last days of the Republic, of course, you know that, the, that uh, Caesar was killed, and then you had Cassius and Brutus, if you've ever read Shakespeare and all those guys, E2 Brute and all that kind of stuff. And so uh, Cassius and Brutus uh, lined up against uh, Octavian, and, uh, and Antony. And uh, then they, the big battle for those two, those four guys, two of them on each side, they met at Philippi and Octavian and uh, Antony won the battle. And as a result, Octavian, who uh, actually later on would defeat Antony and Cleopatra in Egypt, became the top dog out of all four of them, Octavian. And then he went back to Rome, and to honor Caesar, he changed, he made the title uh, from emperor to Caesar. So Julius Caesar just took his last name. And so Caesar uh, became a title. And of course, instead of calling himself Octavian, he called himself Augustus, the great one. August mean, Augustus means great one. So here he is, the great Caesar. And so, of course, it was. It was there during the days of Augustus Caesar that he sent out the decree that all the world should be taxed. Notice how all this ties together. And so here, how the, the, what Augustus did with this was that the Philippi became one of his favorite cities, and the Roman soldier would serve for some, some, from 10 to 15 years, and if he lived through it, then he was given a great portion of land and a stipend for the rest of his life. Well, Philippi became a retirement town for a lot of the soldiers. And they were very proud of their Roman heritage. And notice it says a colony. In other words, they were Romans. And they were proud of Romans, of being Romans. And it's interesting later on, 
when Paul writes to the Philippians, knowing that they were outcasts being saved and so forth, and yet he says, our citizenship is in heaven. And so again, we see how that uh, he uses these terminologies. Uh, and you know, the Bible was not written in a vacuum. It was written with real people around. So we see this, that, uh, that Philippi then was, um, uh, was ready. They were hungry for the things of God. Now, as a result of that, you see another thing here. And Philippi, being a Roman colony, did not have a Jewish synagogue. So they had to meet by the riverside. And so we see now that the, that the Bible tells us that, uh, that in the, on the Sabbath day, uh, they went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made. And we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. So these women, who and there weren't enough men, they had to have 10 men in order, Jews, to, in order to have a synagogue, and they didn't have 10 men in the city. In fact, here, they didn't have any. And so here you have a group of ladies, and isn't it interesting, the first church started in Europe began with a bunch of ladies. Now that would have, I mean, that was totally not Middle Eastern. That's not Eastern. That, I mean, uh, we, you know, women were not... Uh, given that that type of position uh, in, or they didn't have that type of, of opportunity uh, in the Middle East. And here we see a bunch of women were getting on their own on a Sabbath. So that tells us that they were wanting to follow God. And, and that's why I say many of these people were saved old, through the Old Testament uh, promise of salvation and whenever they saw the Savior or they heard this, the message of the Savior, they immediately got saved. And so we see this is what happens here. Was, were some of these people saved before they met Paul? I think so. Because after all, they were worshiping the one and true God. And once they found the Messiah, hey, that's, that's him. The, the Holy Spirit opened their eyes. But here you have these godly people. And they're meeting at the riverside because there's no synagogue and no men. And so, and we see that probably Lydia was a Gentile who was one of the ladies who led the Bible study, possibly, whatever it was. And so they would get together and they would take their prayer request. So ladies, sometimes if, when you have a Bible study or whatever uh, around here, you say, well, where's all the men? Well, you just ask God to, to deal. God has great power working through any group of people, men or women. And here we see that, uh, I wonder what they prayed for. I imagine they were prayed for one thing. They wanted to see the Messiah. They were, Lord, send us somebody who teaches the truth. Lord, help us to begin a synagogue, whatever. They didn't know exactly what the future was. But they met faithfully every Sabbath down by the riverside. And they had a special place down there, maybe a little park, a little enclave. And it says, notice, as they normally would, that means that probably if it snowed or rained, they weren't able to make it that day. But uh, they had a, a time where they wanted to get together and to pray and to seek God's face. And so we see that uh, uh, we sat down and spoke to the women. And so notice that they didn't, uh, you know, and this was teaching. When you sat down, you, pre you, uh, you were teaching. When you stood up, you were preaching. So here we, they sat down to teach the people. Now, a certain woman named Lydia. Now, notice Lydia. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira. Now, do you know where we find Thyatira? Where do we see that? In Revelation chapters 2 and 3. So it's one of the seven cities that the Lord Jesus personally wrote to through the Apostle John. So here we see that by the time John came along, or that the John wrote these letters a generation later, this city had already been evangelized and there were churches there. And it had been there long enough that it had started going downhill. So we see that uh, it had been there for at least a couple of decades. And so the Lord wasn't giving up on Thyatira or Ephesus or anything when he led Paul a different way. It's just interesting. Many people wonder, did Lydia go back and really sow the seeds for Paul to get there? It's just amazing. So we see that uh, she was a seller of purple from Thyatira 
who worshiped God. That means that term means she was a God fearer. She was a Gentile who couldn't go into the. Uh, notice now, she they, these people met to have prayer together as ladies, but even if she was a Gentile, she couldn't go into Gentile to, to the synagogue proper because she was a Gentile, and yet she worshiped God. That tells us that there were a lot of people saved before the cross. A lot of people, whosoever will, may come. And we know that, uh, that if you look back and you read Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Isaiah, they all they preached to the nations around them. And so any, did, did, where did Jonah go? He went to Nineveh. And you look, at, so we see that uh, uh, the, the, the oracle of God was from the Jew, but many Gentiles got saved. Remember you are the Hittite that David treated so badly. He was a Hittite. And yet, he was one of David's mighty men, and he was one of his most faithful men, and he accepted Judaism, as we would call it today, hook, line, and sinker. In other words, he was a saved man that, how sad it is that David murdered. So you get back in there, you can see how that this is all, when you really think about some of these things, you can see just how nasty even godly people can be. But here we see that by the grace of God, that... <coughs> She was a seller of purple. Now, the purple, there was a certain shell, and it's still there today, that uh, was right around that area of Thyatira, and it, had, it exuded a, a certain dye. And so the people of Thyatira, it became one of the major, uh, major uh, industries of Thyatira. And that this, they were known worldwide for this purple dye. And of course, purple was royal color. And it was, if you could dye your clothes, that means it was for the wealthy people. So it was a, an upper echelon city. It was like a, a Chanel number no. five or whatever. You know, it was one of those things that if you had it, then you paid a lot for it. And if you dyed your clothes with it, or if you had some idea, that meant that you had some money. And so, that, so she was... Uh, she was a Coco Chanel of her day or whatever. I mean, she was probably a whole lot better woman than Coco Chanel was, but she was up there as far as in uh, high society uh, was concerned. And yet she was a godly woman. Isn't it interesting how that God can use rich and poor? In fact, it's interesting in this passage, we see a very wealthy woman, and then we see a very poor teenage girl, yeah, all in the same passage and how that God saved them both. Isn't it interesting? God saved a group of women and then a, a, a demon-possessed teenage girl before we ever see any men come to know the Lord Jesus in Europe. So uh, we see here that, um, that she was a seller of purple in the city of Thyatira, and she worshiped God, and notice her heart was ready. God opened her heart to heed the things of Paul. Everyone who was, uh, as I've said many times, everyone in Scripture that sought God found him. And we see that the Jews who sought God found him. The Syrophoenician woman who sought God found him. The woman at the well sought God found him. And of course, every man who did the Greeks, who the Lord says we would see Jesus, they saw him. And so when they, those who were looking for the Messiah always found him. And folks, if you're looking for the Lord Jesus, and anyone in the sound of my voice, if you're looking for him, come unto him. He's calling you. He will save you today because he is the one calling you. He knew you before you will ever know him. Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And so we see that God opened her heart to heed the things of Paul. And so we see that this woman, the seller of purple, she became very prominent. And she, of course, she became one of the great uh, ladies uh, of, of, of history. And she probably helped start and finance this church. And notice she even helped finance. She said, uh, she said we have a big enough house. And probably she had a big store there, a big uh, uh, sublet store or whatever, uh, outlet store or whatever that you have there. She had servants and everything. She said, we have plenty of room to put you up. So come on over and stay. And so at least there were five guys that were able that she was able to put up, and so notice she was baptized in the river there, and so she let everybody in that Roman colony know that she was saved. Most the, the the first baptismal service in Europe was a bunch of women that got saved. Isn't that interesting? Before Phil Philippian jailer ever knew anything about it, and how many husbands were affected by that? 
And so we see that uh, God started uh, European evangelism with a bunch of women. I imagine that strained every pharisaical bone in Paul's body. How, Lord, you sent me over here and you gave me a bunch of women. What am I going to do with this? I mean, that would have been Paul's old nature, wouldn't it? And yet we know that this uh, Paul later on when he wrote to the Philippians, he said, I thank my God upon every rare remembrance of you. They won his heart. And then also you see in Philippians chapter 4, he says, Therefore, my beloved, my long for brethren, brethren and sistren, they said, I want to see you again. You people have meant so much to me. And I could safely say as a pastor, some of the warmest places I have in my heart in my ministry of over 40 years now has been women who have been so faithful to God. I mean, I look back and, and see some of the heartaches and so forth, and I, there's men out there too, of course, but it's amazing how that God brings women into the church to really, well, guys, we can't, have, we can't do without them, you know? And so here again, we see that God starts the churches in, F, in uh, Europe with a bunch of, bunch of women. Now, it's interesting how that God is going to use Paul to raise women to heights they had never seen before. Husband, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Really? You mean I can't sell my wife anymore and I don't buy one in order to marry them and we don't barter back and forth? No, you love her as I love the church. Changes, that changes a lot of things, doesn't it? It's a whole lot better than your father-in-law going to say uh, to you, your husband without you knowing it, uh, going to your father-in-law and saying, listen, I've got a big farm out here and we can make a deal. And if I give you about $50,000, can I take your oldest daughter? Um, my wife would have been out because I didn't have $50,000, but you know. <laughs> but there again, uh, it changed everything. Just, I mean, just, it cha does that change culture? I mean, even today, they still buy and sell wives over the Middle East and other places. And so it's amazing what that did. It, and the Western woman doesn't know. You know, we sing that little song. I remember uh, growing up, um, and we sang about the Titanic. There were husbands and wives, little children lost their lives when the great big Titanic went down. But uh, the one thing about it was the men wanted to put the women on the ships first. And any man that was left over uh, from that, uh, the survival of the Titanic was always kind of wondered, people wondered about him because where were the women and children first? There was a, uh, an Olympic swimmer back in the 70s and she was over in Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka, Lanka and uh, she was on a, um, uh, a ferry. And as they were going across, it tipped over. And these women had all their burkas on and all this. And, and the, the men uh, had a couple of lifeboats and they were piling onto the lifeboats uh, boats, and they were, they were throwing the women off because they had the burkas on and of course they were going to sink. And here she was trying to save these women and the guys were knocking her off the boat because women didn't mean as much as men. They needed to be saved first. Folks, is that a different culture than what we used to have in the United States? Today it's a whole lot different. But there, I grew up in the culture that women, you would, you know, there was a chivalry there. Let's put it that way. But that all comes really from the Christian influence. Husband loves your wife even as Christ loved the church and he gave himself for her. And so, you know, the whole idea of, of treating women differently comes from that. If you love your wife, then that means, uh, you know, the people around her, you know, she's going to have friends. So you've got to treat the women the right way if you, so I understand. I think you understand how that it just it goes out from there. And so we see that the Lord was going to change the world, not only through salvation, but even the whole culture of Europe was going to change as a result of what God was doing here. But we notice now that God had opened her heart. That's what we want to pray for. Lord, now if you've led me here, and it seems like every time I'm talking to someone, it seems like I'm running up against a wall. Then, Lord, give me the open door. Lord, create the need in that person's heart. That's one of the problems we have today. Too, everybody's too rich and too educated. Everybody knows everything and they got everything they want. And all they got to do, if they, if they don't, is just get on the, their little machine and, and daydream. So people don't need God. 
And I'm afraid that he might have to do something to show that we do need him. But uh, folks, there, God usually creates a need in someone's heart, a hunger, an emptiness. And we're looking for that person. And you don't know who they are until you love them and care for them. And then you witness, as you talk to them, they already know what you're going to say. But they see what you have and they want it. He hath put a new song in my mouth, my mouth, even praise unto the Lord. Many shall see it in fear and shall trust in him. Isn't that what we want to see? Oh, Lord, give us open doors. Lord, show us those open hearts. Lord, that person who has a need, who the veneer is to hard as old nails, and hard as old, uh, you know, just hard as a piece of wood. And Lord, it seems like when I'm talking to them about anything about God, they either brush me off or it's like hitting a wall. But Lord, you're going to have to show me the hole in the wall. You've got to show me, Lord, open their hearts and allow your word to go forth. Lord, give us Belvedere. Lord, give us people with hungry hearts, people who have, they've been, they've, they've got all this knowledge, but they don't have the truth. They've got all this money, but they don't have the inner peace. They realize something is missing, something they're searching for. And oh, Lord, show us those people that are ready to accept you as their savior. Now, we don't know who they are. We have to put, punch through the veneer. But if they know who you are, they know who to come to. And oh, that the Lord Jesus Christ would work through us to the salvation of souls. You've got, we've got relatives, you and I both do, who we've witnessed to for years. But folks, as long as they're on earth, that's an open door as far as we're concerned or we're looking for the open door to be able to witness to that person about the Lord Jesus. Do we really care? Do we really love them enough to put up with them? And are we willing to cross an old sea like Paul did in order to meet a hungered person who needed the Lord? And it wasn't a man. Someone has said the, the Macedonian uh, vision was a woman. <laughs> it's not a man. But there again, Paul had no idea what he was going to get into. He's going to be beat half to death before he finds the men to be saved. But oh, what God can do with those who will just keep knocking Keep asking, keep looking, keep moving. And when you're stopped, you wait to see where, where God's going to move you and ask him to lead you in the paths of righteousness. Why? For his name's sake. Let's pray. Father, how we thank you for your promise that you will lead us and you'll never forsake us. And Lord, we thank you for what you've given us. And may we value our salvation, free salvation that we have through our Lord Jesus Christ, and how that you loved us and gave yourself for us. And Lord, may that peace, may that inner fulfilling, may that satisfaction that comes in knowing you, may I see it and want it. Oh, Lord Jesus, may you give us open doors. May, as we are concerned about our relatives, we're concerned about our city, we're concerned about our neighbor, our neighbors, and Lord, we, many times we don't know where the, uh, we, we wonder how to approach that person with the gospel. How we pray, Lord, that you would open their hearts and open our eyes to their need. Oh, Lord, we pray for souls, that you would save them and change them, and that you would use weak people like us to lead them to you, to yourself. Thank you for your blessings upon us now. Use us, we pray, in Jesus' name, amen.